So let me start with the introduction of the speaker quickly. Today we have uh, Rahul Singh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of ECIAC. Earlier, he has been a postdoctoral researcher at the Ohio State University and LIDS, MIT. He received BTEC in EE from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur in 2009, MS in EE from the University of Notre Dame in 2011, and PhD in Computer Engineering from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Texas a and University College Station in 2015. He has also worked in the industry as a data scientist at Encore Incorporation and in the machine learning group at Intel Santa Clara. His research interests include stochastic control, machine learning, Markova decision processes, and networks. We welcome you, sir, and over to you. Can you enable screen share for me? Uh, now it is enabled, sir. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, not yet. So could you try now? Sure. Okay, uh, do you see PDF file? Learning and control for networks? Yes, yes, we do see, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Welcome everyone. So in this talk, I'll present uh, some of the results of, uh, some recent results of mine in the area of learning and control for networks. These are the contents of this talk. I'll begin by showing how you can model networks as stochastic dynamical systems. And then I will discuss some commonly employed techniques for optimizing stochastic dynamical systems. So for example, dynamic programming and the Bellman equation. And over here, I'll also show you some recent works of mine with uh, Itan Modiano from MIT. And then we look at some sample complexity issues in reinforcement learning. Okay. Uh, then we'll see how we can improve upon these results by using multi-arm bandits and adaptive control. Okay, and then I will discuss some of my uh, recent theoretical works, which is a joint work with uh, Professor Kumar at Texas A&M University. Okay. So let's begin with uh, networks and stochastic dynamical system. Now I'll go to uh, one note, just a minute. Do you see the one note screen over here? Yes, sir, we do see. Okay, so let's begin with a very simple queuing network, just a simple single queue system. Okay. So what happens is uh, it's a single queue. There's a server, there's a buffer, or the waiting area. Okay. And these are your customers which are waiting in your queue. Okay. And this is the queue length at time t. So for example, think of customers who are waiting to get service by a server. So this could be, for example, a wireless network where you have packet arrivals. Okay, so this arrival at a rate lambda. So let's say lambda is the probability with which you have a packet arrival or a new customer who arrives into the queue. Okay, and you can use it for modeling, let us say, uh, service systems, such as Amazon Web Service, or for example, data networks. or mobile networks. Okay, and over here, what you have to do is you have to choose your service rate. Okay, so U is basically the control at time T, the decision at time T, and this is your service rate. Decide, it basically controls your 
So this is your probability distribution of the amount of service delivered. So for example, the actual service might be a Bernoulli random variable. In that case, uh, this ut, it might denote your uh, probability with which your service is completed. Okay, so in general, your arrival, so you have an arrival process and you have a departure process. So service process is ut. So this basically decides your service rate. Okay, and the typical problem is, how do you choose this uh, service process, UT, to minimize your queuing delay. So we look at different types of cost functions. So this was a single node network. Uh, we can also have more complicated multi-node networks. So for example, over here you can have, let's say, so this is your, uh, whenever I draw this, this is a queue, and these individual entities are uh, basically customers or packets or uh, some sort of job okay, which needs service. So over here you have, let's say, uh, node one. And after getting service at node one, so this is the server. Okay, and after a job, so this is a job and it will get a service by the server. And then it will go to either Q2 or Q3. Okay, and over here you have to decide the same thing, the service rate at each of these links. So basically the rate at which you send the completed jobs to Q2, the second node, or uh, to the third node. So these again are random variables. So once you basically choose your U2, what happens is the actual uh, routing. So this is called routing. What happens is once a job gets service over here at node one, it has to be routed to node two or three. Okay, and for this, you have this these processes. And these are called routing processes or uh, queue control processes. So there's more complicated uh, phenomena. And you can sort of uh, visualize this in uh, a manufacturing facility. So for example, if you have a car, car processing plant, then over here, the first stage might be shared by multiple components, and then component one might go to uh, via this route, and the component two might go via this route. Okay, and they might get assembled later on. So you can use it to model different manufacturing facilities or even a cloud networking environment where uh, different jobs have different types of requirements. Any questions so far? What is the constraint here in choosing UP? So currently you can just assume uh, it's a service rate. So it, it will have some sort of upper and lower bound. So let's say A and B are some real numbers. And basically if you choose the service rate equal to X, okay, let's say UT equals to X, uh, maybe let us say the service distribution is exponential distribution with mean x. So you can assume, let's say ut has to be positive. Or let us say if you have a discrete PDF, so the service distribution is basically, it's a PDF of your service. Basically on the x-axis, we have number of service. The y-axis we have, the probability associated with that. And UT basically controls this curve. So one way to do it is basically assume some sort of parametric dependence, okay? That uh, service completion is an exponential random variable and then UT is actually the rate of that exponential random variable. In general, it can be some other parameter, okay? So for example, in Bernoulli random variable, you can have the mean uh, control the service rate. Does that make sense? Yes, I was asking, like, what is the problem in increasing uh, service rate to a very large value? I mean, there must be some cost uh, 
correct 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 so uh, that's we are heading towards now so let's look at uh, the question so okay so basically if you use the high service rate it leads to wear and tear and you have to pay a price for it so we'll come to that now so basically over here if i plot the trajectory so let's say it's a multi uh, node system okay so let's say this is q1t stochastic process So what happens is these are all stochastic processes. If you have multiple nodes, all of them will evolve in a random way. All of these are actually random variables. So what might happen is Q1T might assume. So it has to basically assume values from the set of functions. Okay. Functions which map time to reals. And how do you describe this process? You describe it by quantifying these values. Okay. So let's say you operate your system for capital T number of time steps, okay? Now for each time, one, two, dot, 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 till capital T, you have Q length values. You have to give the probability distribution, okay? So this is probability. To describe the stochastic process, you have to give basically the probability associated with each possible random path, okay? So this is path one, this is path two, this is path three. And you have to give complete characterization of all of these parts. Okay, and now let's come to what exactly uh, is that we are going to do. We are going to optimize this cost function. Okay. So let's assume we have a two node thing. Okay, so we just have two queues. So you get service over here and then it goes into the second queue to get service. So you have to choose the service rate here and you have to choose the service rate over here. And this is your arrival rate and you cannot control it. Okay. What is beta? Beta is a discount factor. What is this? This quantity over here is the expectation. Okay, so let's look at the terms over here. Uh, what is happening over here? I am basically summing up the entire thing from uh, t equals to one to t equals to infinity. And at time t, you incur two types of cost. The first cost is the performance. You want your Q lengths to be low. Why? Because uh, Q length at time t is the number of customers who are waiting in your, let us say, cloud facility or they're waiting in your restaurant and you don't want too many people to wait. You have to optimize your performance. Okay, That is where the first term shows up. This is the performance. And what is the second term? It is the, uh, let us say, control cost or wear and tear. Wear and tear, okay? So for example, if you are using uh, some facilities, if you use them at a very high rate, at a rapid rate, they will be priced for it. Okay. So typically if, uh, on the x-axis you have u, you have cost over here, it's let's say quadratic. The uh, cost at time t is going to increase with your uh, control cost, control uh, quantity. And what is beta doing over here? It's basically doing some sort of discounting. You can forget it for the time being, we can assume it's basically t equals to one to capital T, and then you can get rid of beta factor. But what it does essentially is it makes sure that your problem is well composed. So, okay, so if you plot this curve beta raised to power t, it's giving lesser weightage to future rewards. And it is very commonly employed. Money which you earn in future is less important as compared to what you earn now. So it's coming from there. Is this clear? Like what is the performance objective? So, so what is the intuition for having this Q square uh, just to... Oh, so uh, you can have just Q also. That is also fine. You can have Q1T plus Q2T. The intuition is you want lesser number of, uh, number of people who are waiting in the queue. You don't want the queues to explode. Why? Because uh, these are the jobs which are waiting. 
it will lead to higher delays so if you send some customers to amazon web service okay and they are waiting in the cloud to get service they might leave if they have to wait for a lot a lot of time that's why you want lesser queue length okay, so these algorithms are used all over the place okay so even in atm networks so when you are using atm or when you are logging into facebook okay why so because if you wait for a lot of time uh, you might leave actually the customer might leave that that is the intuition does that make sense so the queue length over here it keeps increasing there are many people who are waiting here you see so does it have to be like q or q square like whatever makes it convex i mean is that the assumption oh uh, no not uh, not true so you can have q t you can have q square q q anything which is increasing okay. any monotonic increasing so basically you take your q length and you have to come up with some increasing function that is fine yeah thank you uh, does that make sense yes okay great okay and over there we had some sort of expectation operator so what we are doing is uh, we had some cost at time t and this cost was let's say uh, qt plus u square t okay there are multiple nodes but i'll just ignore that for the time being what is this expectation with respect to so if you recall our q length is a random process so there are multiple possibilities this is possibility 1 this is possibility 2 this is possibility 3 okay. when you when you take expectation you are basically averaging it over all these possibilities okay so basically uh, this is essentially probability of path 1 times the cost which you incur at path 1 plus cost which you incur in path 2 plus probability of path 3 into cost and so on okay is this clear like why is this expectation over here yes okay so uh now what we'll do is this so we'll view these uh, networks as dynamical systems okay. so you had the service rate you can choose there is external Does the Q length evolve? So you have Q times T plus one. Ah, uh, is my voice clear? Is the network fine, or are there drops in, in the network? The voice is still fine. Okay, great. Okay, so the Q length evolution looks something like this. Okay, so basically, it is time t, uh, whatever the Q length, plus arrival. So this is arrival minus departure. Okay. So if you try to plot it on the y-axis, so if you are standing over here at time t, we have some sort of positive drift due to arrivals. and then you have a negative drift because of the departure this departure is also random arrival is also random okay and the probability distribution of your departure the probability distribution this is a function of your service rate ut okay this is the setup now a dynamical system is basically this quantity over here what is this uh, there is a state okay so let's look at these terms what is this this is the state of the system okay you can use a dynamical system 
stochastic dynamical system okay. uh, you can use it to model anything in the uh, most of the things in the uh, day to day life okay so for example think of xt as your temperature room temperature okay so room temperature at time t plus 1 is a function of the current value of the room temperature plus some inputs controls what what is that control that could be air conditioning for example okay and some noise what is this noise this noise is anything which is sort of not known to you you cannot predict it beforehand this might be fluctuations in the weather you know or maybe rain or sun or something of that sort okay and this is random or it's also used to model stock markets where you don't know the prices and you have to invest your money okay and this is a stochastic dynamical system and it's a very broad area broad field you can use it to model lots of phenomena in day to day life okay now for this stochastic is this clear like what is happening here and t is discrete 1 2 3 dot dot is this clear or what is a stochastic dynamical system it's a system which moves okay so there is a notion of state Yeah, this could be, for example, the position of car on the 2D plane. Okay, so if you have a 2D plane, x and y axis, yeah, and this car which is moving, and there is some noise also. Why? Because winds or maybe uh, your car is not functioning as designed. Yeah, so the evolution of the car, the car itself, is stochastic dynamical system. Is this clear? Any question on this? What is stochastic dynamical system? Okay, so now you see basically a network can be modeled as a stochastic dynamical system. Why? Because see, in a simple queue, you have this equation. You can view this queue length as the system state. Try to relate these two quantities over here. Okay, so time t plus one, you have state as queue length at time t plus one. Arrival and departure are noisy. Okay, so you can view uh, this departure. The probability distribution of the departure as your control variable ut over here okay and the arrival the randomness in arrival and departure are omega t the noise at time t and you can basically model more complicated scenarios also here is this clear like uh, what is the dynamical system yes yes sir okay so uh, in dynamical system stochastic dynamical system your typical problem is once again okay so what is happening over here So this is your trajectory. So think of this as your trajectory, which is random. This is your discount factor, okay, and this is your reward. Reward at time t. Okay, this, for example, uh, this could be something like this. Okay, you want your state to be less. <clears throat> for example, x t could be temperature at time t. U t could be air conditioning. So if you uh, spend a lot of money in air conditioning, you will have to pay a price for it. So your reward function could actually be like this. You have to maximize your reward. For that, you have to design your controls. Okay, UT. This is the set of controls. Okay, so t equals to one to capital T. And what does it do? Once you choose this, you maximize the total reward which you earn during a time horizon of capital T. so this is called optimization of stochastic dynamical system stochastic dynamical system and how do you do that okay, so there is a very well known algorithm called dynamic program okay, dynamic program Okay, so let's say your x t so this is your state space 
basically your state, it can assume values in your state space. If for example, single server queue, let's say the buffer was finite. So you can have so many packets who can wait in the queue. So your state space was zero, one, dot, 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 till B. Okay. UT is your, uh, this thing is your control set. So this is your state space. And for example, this could be a service rate. This is the positive uh, ANBR positive. And this is your service rate. Okay, now in dynamic programming, what happens is you have value function. Any questions on this material so far? Can you just recall what is A? Okay, so uh, see, UT is basically a service rate. It has to be a positive quantity. So A and B are positive numbers, and you have to choose your service rate from this interval, A to B. Okay, and what is this V beta? Okay, so this is a value function. Have you studied uh, dynamic programming? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. Uh, MDP. MDP, you have studied. Okay, so this is the value function. What it does is it basically maps your state space to your real. Okay, and this is the optimal reward which you earn when you start in state X. So this is the maximum possible expected reward which you earn when you start in state X, okay? And this function, it satisfies a certain equation called the Bellman equation. Okay. This is a Bellman equation. And uh, what is it? Or uh, what is the variable here? This function V is the variable over here. It, it involves function. And what is happening over here? There's an operator called the Bellman operator which maps a function V to another function. Okay. So let's say F is the set of functions from your state space to your reals. Okay. Then basically the Bellman operator T, it maps your function to a function. It takes a function from uh, this space F and it maps to another function. Do you see why, why so? Because over on the right side, so, uh, let's do this. So over here, Okay, I should have explained this term. This is the probability with which you go from state X to state Y if you apply a control U. Okay. And this is the Bellman operator. It takes a function F. On the right side, you have again a function. So this is defined for each value of X. It belongs to your state space. Okay. So basically T is the Bellman operator. Do you see why so? Why is it taking a function as an input on the right side? So this is a function over here. Okay, and when, once you do all these operations, you do it for each x and you get a function. Any questions on this? It's fine. Any question on dynamic programming? So what exactly are we optimizing and what is the objective here? Who 
will you please extend this uh, uh, Billman operator here? Sure. Uh, so what it does is basically it takes as input your functions. From the right side, you have a function f. Okay. So once you do this for each uh, x, okay, you will get this value. So p f x. Okay. You do it for each value of x belongs to capital X. So capital X is your state space. So once you do it for f, you get f so you map f to f so this is the mapping you start with the function f you compute what is there on the right side okay and you do it for each x do you see the connection now so basically t is a operator which maps a function to a function Okay, what can be shown is that this Bellman operator has a unique fixed point. Let's call it the value function, okay? So V beta is your value function. The optimal value function. What we have is P of V beta equals to V beta. Okay, this can be shown. Have you have you learned diamond programming in uh, some course earlier? Maybe in uh, computer science. Is that correct? Has anyone studied diamond programming earlier? I have studied. Okay, so uh, this Belman operator P has a unique fixed point, the value function. Okay, and what is the optimal policy? Okay, so policy is basically a map from your state to control. Okay, so what will happen is, for example, in your twin network, this will be some function of your Q length at time T. Okay. It's basically a map from your state space. Over here, your state is what? Q length and U is what? Your service rate. So you will choose the service rate as a function of your current Q length. This is called a policy, which is a map from your state to service rate, okay? And what is an optimal policy? An optimal policy chooses So basically over here, <clears throat> so there's a probability with which you go from state X to state Y under control U. Okay, so basically the optimal action when you are in state X okay, is given by solving this, the right hand side. So U, the input U, it has to maximize this quantity. What is this? The first term is the instantaneous reward when you take control u in state x. The second quantity over here is the future reward. Okay. This future. Okay, so for example, when you are betting in stock market, not only do you look at the current price, but you also look at the future price. And this is exactly your future price. Okay. So these algorithms are used for a betting in stock market. And this is basically your, let us say your future reward. So you don't have to be greedy. You shouldn't be greedy when you are investing 
or when you are designing your uh, queuing network. So this is how you get an optimal policy. So policy phi is basically a function which tells you how to choose ut as a function of the current queue length. Okay, and you can use it for very complicated networks also. So I, what I covered so far is a very simple network. But let's say you have something more complicated. So how about this? We have the source over here. Packets are arriving over here. Okay, at node one, you have to choose between, let us say, uh, the service rate on each of these links. Okay, so U one T is the uh, decision process over here, one to two. U two is over here. Okay, over here also you have to, let's say, choose uh, decisions. So, how do you decide U one over here? So each of these links are, let us say, stochastic. So these nodes are basically your, let us say, uh, a network node. And each of these arrow is basically a link. Okay, And each of these link is random. Okay? And basically, if you choose service rate UT at a particular link, you get some random service. And the PDF of that service is decided by UT. And how can you choose U U1 unless you know what is happening over here? Why? Because the packets which are sent on this route, you will have to encounter whatever is happening over here. There might be an adversary sitting over here. Okay, so the delays over here might be more. So it's a very complicated process. How do you design the vector U? Okay, so uh, what do I call vector U? Vector U is U1, U2, collection of all of these four decision processes. Design these UT. You can again use the dynamic programming okay, or the Bellman equation to solve this. Also, over here, each x is your state. Okay, x will actually be a vector of two length, q1 to q6. So there are six nodes in your network: one, two, three, four, five, six. Each node has a q length, and that q length becomes your state vector. And that goes into your dynamic programming equation. And then you can basically use uh, your uh, dynamic programming algorithm to design the optimal uh, service traits. Is that clear? Like roughly the high level idea, how you can solve such problems? Yes. Okay. so. Uh, the second part is basically learning. Okay. Uh, maybe reinforcement learning. Okay, so far, uh, what we did was uh, we assumed. So this is your value function. Okay. Optimal value function, the Bellman equation. And while you solve the Bellman equation, uh, you realize that on the right side, we had max over all the possible inputs. So this is your control variable or your decision variable, okay? Plus summation over all the y belongs to your state space. Probability that you go from state x to state y when you apply your control u this u same as this u. So u enters twice, current reward and future. Okay, so this is your uh, Bellman equation, okay? v beta x. You need to know your probabilities, okay? These are typically not known. So for example, if you have a single queuing network, your lambda and your uh, service rates, okay? So when you choose your service rate equals to let us say u, 
we typically don't know what is the exact service rate. So this might be just one of the decision variables. For example, how much of a wireless uh, transmitted energy you are going to employ. The actual probability, the actual uh, probability which is realized, that you may not know because that might be very complicated. So in wireless, for example, you have capacity equals to log SNR, okay? one plus SNR. You may know the signal which you are applying, the transmission energy, but you may not know the noise okay, that you might have to learn. Okay, and this might actually decide your service rate or your uh, PDF, how much amount of service you get. And because you don't know what the noise is, you may not know. So, so, so essentially in a single node network, Lambda and the service rate okay, of your PDF of your departure are the transition probabilities in your Feldman equation. And you may not know these. So these might not be given to you. Then what will you do? How will you learn the optimal control? So if you know the value function V, okay, for each value of X belongs to your state space, then you can derive the optimal policy. Okay, by minimizing your this quantity. But what if you don't know this? What if you don't know these quantities? You cannot solve it. You cannot get the optimal value function V and you cannot implement the optimal policy. So for this, you have something called Q learning. Okay, so in Q learning, what happens is you basically operate your system or reinforcement learning. Okay. Let me do a screen share. material so far like what is uh, what exactly are you optimizing yes okay let me see. Uh, share paper. Just one minute. I'm trying to share paper over here. Somehow it's not working. Stop this year and just one. Uh, do you see a paper being shared? Yes, we see. Okay, so we're here. Uh, so let's look at reinforcement learning. Okay, okay so uh, over here what we did was something of this sort. So we looked at a network. So for example, what you may have is a very complicated network. So for example, these are, okay, so each node in your graph over here is a wireless node and a wired node, a data, uh, network node and each arrow over here is a communication node yeah, and the nodes over here on the left side which are labeled s are source so these are basically source of data packet arrivals and each of them the destination is same over here the node d it's a very complicated network there are multiple nodes and there are multiple links and each link is rendered you don't know the quality of that link. It might be 
under attack by some adversary okay so for uh, there might be like some link in this network which might be under attack by some adversary or it might actually be a wireless link uh, where the snr is really bad the noise is high okay and you don't know this network at all and what you have to do is you have to basically design routing policy or scheduling policies which decide where should the packets be routed to so that the end to end packet delays is minimal do you get the problem statement like what is happening over here so if i don't know the network how can i decide this routing is basically uh, this is your source node is that correct for this flow you know that you have three nodes you are connected to node 4 node 5 and node 3 okay similarly for this node sf1 it knows that it is connected to three nodes nodes 1 2 3 that's it it doesn't know anything else so go to a source node s okay go to a particular source node s and what it sees is basically it is connected to the downstream nodes 1 2 3 okay for this node it is 4 5 and 3 that's all that's all it knows it knows nothing else and it only gets to observe the end to end packet delay so it will send a packet and it will get to know what is the delay which it suffers that's all so it has to choose between these three routes route 1 2 or 3 the remaining routing is done with him so it's a very complicated uh, process which is running on the uh, back end it won't get to observe the state at all it will only uh, that state will actually be reflected in the delays so that delay is capturing a lot of information about your network even though you don't know what is happening in the network that delay is helping you somehow do you hear me hello so uh, the objective is to inherently learn the network uh, in some sense uh... Uh, yeah correct not the network the optimal routing policy in this case the optimal control policy that is the objective for example uh, see this one more a better example you just have two flows two nodes and at this node you have to decide whether you should send to this or this node similarly over here now what is happening here you don't know you don't know what is the quality of link 1 or link 2 or link 3 so link 2 is good very very good maybe both of them should send to node uh, this middle node okay and how do you solve such problems for such problems we have something called q learn so i won't go through this but this is a nice uh, reinforcement learning algorithm which we developed okay and what happens is basically you use the same it show that these uh, bellman operator when you basically do some iterative learning it converges okay so let's look at the equations very quickly is the statement clear at least what is the objective you have to minimize the end to end delay so that is the objective and you don't know what is happening in the network and the algorithm is uh, basically some sort of uh, variant of q learn and what is so don't confuse this queue with the queue learning uh, queue operator so uh, just one minute okay so basically you have this value function what will happen is basically each source node it will maintain some sort of value function you look at your uh, queue length at the immediate node okay and it will also look at the service rate which it chooses okay so for flow f over here q is your q length at the next node u is the service rate which it chooses on that node and on the right side basically i have uh, the bellman equation but it is applied to only those uh, set of states where you actually visit the system and you can basically prove uh, that this scheme okay, we call it 
overlay controller, but it's actually a queue learning algorithm. So more complicated uh, reinforcement learning algorithm, which is very popular in AI. Okay. Uh, you can basically use some ideas from uh, the area of stochastic differential equation. Okay. And you can analyze uh, the probability with which this equation, this algorithm, it converts. So you can model this algorithm by a stochastic differential equation. And you can show that with probability one, okay, this quantity here, it measures the discrepancy of this algorithm with the stochastic differential equation. And you can show that in extremely large duration of time, it converges with the optimal value function and we get the optimal policy. Okay. And this policy is much better than the existing policy, such as the max weight or the back pressure controller. So over here, we basically compare our results with back pressure. So OBP is the back pressure or the max weight algorithm. The delay is in red, which is much better, like half the delay. Okay, so now uh, let's go to multi arm bandit very quickly. Reinforcement learning may not be very uh, effective. And uh, why? Because uh, what may happen is. Uh, Iterations might be very slow. So uh, there's something called multi-arm bandit problem. Has anyone in this talk heard of what a multi-arm bandit problem is? Yes. Okay. So in multi-arm bandit, what happens is there are different arms, okay? And there is a player, player. And this player has to choose between multiple arms at each time. You can think of these arms as routes. Okay, so for example, if you have a data packet network and there are two paths, path one, path two, and let's say the delays are different. So maybe uh, D1 is the random delay here, D2 is the random delay here, which is which has a higher chance of uh, serving the packet or making sure the packet reaches a destination in lesser time. Okay. So this is the multi arm bandage problem. There are different options or arms and we can think of these arms as a uh, path or something else. But the end goal is once you pull an arm, each arm has a reward process. Okay. So basically this time, so reward which you get from arm one might look like that. So let's say you just have two arms for simplicity, okay? And basically, let's say the reward is basically a summation of Bernoulli, okay? So uh, at each time, basically, we do a coin toss, and the mean of that coin toss is equal to the, uh, it basically depends upon the arm. Okay, here the mean might be mu one, here mean might be mu two. So if you keep pulling the arm one, your total reward, okay? So what is happening over here? You're basically adding the reward over time. That reward is basically going to become, average slope is going to become mu one. Over here, the average slope is going to become mu two. Okay, so if you play just one arm for time t, t. So time t, you basically pull an arm called ut and you get a reward, which is basically a Bernoulli random variable with mu mu i t. Okay. Is this clear what is happening? For example, if you just have two points, point one, point two, and uh, the probability with which, okay, so this point gives you outcome zero and one. The probability with which you get one is basically mu one. Okay, that is what is happening. And if you keep doing point sources, keep basically uh, collecting rewards from an arm, uh, it will actually look like this. So it's random. There are fluctuations over here, but the slope is going to converge to mu one. And the big part over here is you have to maximize. 
the objective over here is you have to maximize your total reward from one to capital T without knowing mu one and mu two. You don't know these slopes. So what you have to do is you have to keep sampling both the arms. So over here mu two is less. So you, do, you shouldn't ideally you shouldn't sample from red curve at all. But you still have to play. Sometimes you have to play the red arm. Why? Because you have to learn about mu. Okay, so if you know mu one and mu two both, uh, you'll just play mu one arm one. Is that clear? Like what is happening here? What is your objective? Okay, so you can use this to model different phenomena. Okay, so in stock market, you have different stocks, one to n. Each of them have different reward rate or earning, and yet you don't know uh, what is the earning rate. Okay, so basically, you can model multi-arm bandits to model that stock. Uh, you can use it to model uh, web design. Okay, so ad placement. So you have different advertisements. So let's say you are Google. You have different ads. Okay, ad one, ad two, ad n. Each ad. So if you present this ad, maybe uh, the probability with which a user clicks is much higher than the probability with which the user clicks on this ad. It's also used in clinical trials. We have different arms. Are actually medicines or medications. Okay, so this problem has lots and lots of applications. And if you do a very quick Google search, Do you see the PDF file, summer school? Yes. yes. Okay, so if you do a very quick Google search, you will see around millions of hits. Millions of hits uh, in half a second. Okay, so it's a very popular problem. It's a, it has lots and lots of applications. Is the bandit problem clear? Like, uh, what is the problem statement? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the multi-arm bandit problem, and you can definitely use it for network applications. Where, uh, let's say, each node in the network has some packets which are arriving, and it has multiple paths. That it, that it can take, okay? And you don't for here are random, and you need to learn the delays, and you need to also make sure the delay is less. Uh, that is a multi arm bandit problem. Okay, and uh, what is the connection with reinforcement learning? So, so I, I'll very quickly go through what is, uh, okay, so this was your dynamical system. This is omega t, uncertainty at time t. So this was a stochastic dynamical system. And let's say you don't know the function f, okay. So let's say this is unknown. And you still want to maximize this quantity is your mathematical expectation. So this quantity is the reward which you get at time t and it's a function of the current system state xt and the control input ut. Okay? And you have to design your ut to maximize this. Okay? And this quantity is not known. And this problem is called adaptive control or reinforcement learning. Okay. Or reinforcement learning. RN. 
it's used in uh, AI techniques, okay? AI applications a lot. And I'll give some history. So, uh, and this was, okay, so the study into adaptive control was initiated by Richard Bellman. So there's the same Richard Bellman who invented dynamic programming. Okay, so he basically posed the problem of adaptive control. Okay, so he had uh, published a lot in around 50s where he posed this problem and he gave some preliminary solutions which are not very optimal. Okay, and you can see that even the bandit problem, even the bandit problem can be posed as adaptive control problem. How come? Because in the bandit case, uh, do you see the uh, one note or a PDF file? One uh, note. The one note. Okay, so in the multi arm bandit, you have different arms. Okay. And each arm has a mean reward rate, mu. You can view this mu n as the state at time t, roughly. And it's not changing at all. And uh, the reward at time t basically depends upon the arm which you pull at time t. So you can see that basically uh, this adaptive control problem, is this clear like what is adaptive control problem? You have a stochastic dynamical system, which is moving, xt is your state, this is your reward at time t, it's a function of your current state and control, and you want to maximize your total reward by choosing your ut, the control inputs. And you can use it, you can use this formulation to definitely model the multi arm bandit problem. So over here, I had this multi arm band problem where you had a single player and you had multiple arms and each of them had random reward and the mean was not known to you. And in adaptive control, you don't know the dynamics, system dynamics. So the function f over here is system dynamics, okay? Control is like a superset of multi arm band problems. And this was studied by Richard Bellman. And uh, it was not solved for a lot of time, for multiple decades. And finally, it was uh, solved in this, in a series of works by Kumaro. So, okay, it was, so this was the uh, adaptive, do you see the PDF file? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay, so it was finally resolved in a series of works by P.R. Kumar, and uh, he developed this algorithm called RBML, Reward Biased Maximum Likelihood Estimate Algorithm. Okay, and this algorithm was popular in the control community. And that time it was not paid a lot of attention by the statistics people, the statisticians. And currently what happened was the machine learning community or the statisticians, uh, the statistics community, they started paying attention to it. Okay. And we have some recent works with Professor Kumar, where we analyze the uh, regret, or basically the convergence rate of this algorithm. So this algorithm, the RBMLE algorithm, it basically solves the reinforcement learning problem. It was the first algorithm to solve it and it's very efficient. And why has it gained uh, popularity now? Because uh, it has a very good empirical performance. Okay. So I'll first of all describe like, what is a metric? How do you judge a learning algorithm? Okay, so if you have a reinforcement learning algorithm, how do you measure its performance? So you may have multiple algorithms out there. How do you compare them? So let's say theta true is your true system parameter. Okay, so for example, if you have a, dynamical system, theta might parameterize your transitions. This quantity is the probability with which you go from state X to state Y if you apply the control U. Okay, and R star theta two is the optimal average reward you get when theta true is the true parameter. This quantity regret, which is the time horizon which you operate times the optimal reward rate, the actual optimal reward rate minus the actual reward which you get 
during the system operation. So this quantity is the total reward which you get when you operate the system. So if the regret is high, it means your algorithm is not doing good. Why? Because you are getting less reward as compared to what you can obtain if you knew the true parameter. So if you knew theta true, you could optimize your actions. If you knew, knew your network links, the network uh, conditions, okay, the network SNR, or if you knew the performance of the stock market stocks, you could always invest in the best stock. Why go for lesser uh, valued stock? But you don't know that. Okay, and how do you measure the performance of your algorithm? You look at the regret, how much loss you suffer because of not knowing theta true. And because of this, uh, okay, so this is a regret. This is the matrix to judge the performance of learning algorithms. And the RBMLE algorithm, which we have recently uh, rediscovered. So this was uh, first proposed in 1982 by uh, Pierre Kumar. And now it has again gained popularity with the learning community. Why? Because its empirical performance is very good. So uh, first, first of all, let me describe some state-of-the-art learning algorithms, okay. Okay, so basically there are three, uh, two popular algorithms out there. First is the upper confidence bound algorithm. This upper confidence bound algorithm, it was proposed by Lai and Robbins okay, from Stanford in 1985. So Lai is a statistician, okay, and uh, UCP algorithm was uh, proposed by him in 85. In controls community, we had this RBMLE algorithm proposed by Kumar and Becker in 1982. Then there was a third algorithm, Thomson sampling. Okay. It was proposed by William Thomson in 1933. He's also, he was a biostatistician. Okay. And this is a Bayesian algorithm out here. Okay. So we have three algorithms and these two are very, very popular. Okay. And RBMLE was not... Uh, noticed by machine learning community then but when we actually started implementing it we realized it's doing much better than ucb and thomson sample okay so let me show you the regret of these three algorithms so regret basically means uh, how much you lose okay so if your regret is low it means you lose less so you're better so we implemented rbmle for uh, reinforcement learning task okay so this blue curve it's beating red and green. So TSD is basically a variant of Thomson sampling. And UCRL is basically a variant of the UCB algorithm. If you recall, UCB was proposed by Lyon Robbins. And we also tested it for multi unbanded algorithms out there in uh, online machine learning. Okay. So over here we compute. Uh, we basically compare uh, RBMLE on linear bandits. What is a linear bandit problem? Basically, linear bandits are used by companies like Google and Facebook to place advertisements on your page because they want to learn what is your uh, favorite choice. And we see basically RBMLE is doing much better than the traditional algorithms like UCB or Thomson Sample. Okay, and then we started uh, doing a theoretical performance analysis. And what we showed in this work and some more works to follow is that the regret of this RBMV algorithm is uh, order log T, where capital T is the operating time horizon. And more details like the pre-factor before log T and how competitive it is with other algorithms that can be found in this paper. Okay, uh, now you have this uh, learning algorithm. You can use it for uh, different uh, network applications as well as other applications. How much time do we have? We still have time till uh, 11. Yeah. So 20 more minutes. I see. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'll actually uh, describe this RBM game. So let's say. Let's first of all look at the algorithm. What does it do? So let's say theta is a parameter. So this parameter basically describes your system. For example, in the bandit problem, uh, this could be uh, the mean rewards, okay? But basically, in the dynamical system setup, this function f could be theta. So let's say theta is basically a parameter which describes your system, and you don't know theta. Okay. Is your operating time horizon? By choosing UT. Okay, what RBM algorithm does is it says this. So uh, let's say log likelihood of theta at time t is What is the probability that at time s you are in state xs and go to state x, s plus one and under the application of the control us if your true parameter is theta so this is the log likelihood okay. maximize this log likelihood so this parameter belongs to some compact parameter space. And if you uh, maximize this, you get theta hat t is the empirical estimate. What RBMLE says is define a function g for each theta. So let's say this is your capital theta. The small theta is basically some point here. This is your parameter space. Okay, so this can be let's say width one. This can also be width one. Okay. What is this term? Is the optimal reward. Theta equals to uh, theta is two value. If you know theta, and if in the multi arm bandit problem, the true values or the true uh, mean values of these arms, then you will use, uh, you'll basically play the best arm, which has the highest mean. Then R star theta will be basically the maximum of all theta, the maximum value of all the mean values of arms. So it is optimal reward rate when you know the true parameter. Alpha is some bias parameter, okay, which gives a bias to those parameters which are doing better, which have a higher reward rate. What is this quantity? This is a KL penalty. If you have taken some course in statistics, information theory. And this is the KL divergence. So this is basically a KL uh, divergence between the empirical estimate theta hat at time t and a parameter theta, which belongs to your parameter space. Okay, so basically what you do is you maximize over theta g theta t. You're trying to be close to the empirical estimate, but you're also trying to uh, be more sort of optimistic. You're trying to go towards those parameters which have a better reward, maximum optimal reward. Okay, so let's say you maximize this quantity and you get 
theta star t. Okay, then at time t, you basically implement the strategy which is optimal. What is this pi star? So pi star is the optimal strategy when theta star is actual theta. So for example, if uh, mu one and mu two, these are the optimal mean, uh, these are the actual reward values, then what will pi star do? You should give pi star to mu one and mu two, it will play the arm with the higher mean. Okay? So if mu one is greater than mu two, then pi star will play arm one. If mu two is greater than mu one, then pi star will play uh, arm two. Okay? So this is the optimal strategy. So arguing the algorithm, it basically computes a function g, it optimizes it, gets theta star t, and then uses a strategy which is optimal for this particular uh, theta star. Okay? And this was the first learning algorithm which was frequentist. And it has a very good empirical performance, and we basically initiated a program to op to basically analyze it theoretically. And we have shown that it's doing better than the best. We are also extending it to some other problems. Okay, so that's all from my side. Uh, any questions? Any questions from a student? So participants can uh, uh, unmute themselves and ask the questions uh, or you can put them in chat also. So uh, like uh, theoretical guarantee for RBML is like uh, the regret is less than equals to uh, log t, right? So it's supposed to be order log t. Uh, there's a prefactor also so, that, yeah. So, so uh, for uh, UCB, what is the difference? So for that also, it's similar, right? No, oh, okay, so there's a lower bound also. So basically what Lai and Robbins have shown is there is a lower bound okay, that, all, that is also supposed to be log t. Okay, what UCB does, it has a matching upper bound. But it's a min max result. So uh, there might be gaps. So the naive UCB has a gap. That gap is filled by KL UCB. Okay, and our algorithm also is uh, similar. To, uh, I mean, the performance guarantees are similar to KL UCB, but the empirical performance is much better. And the empirical, uh, not just empirical, so it first of all predates UCB. That is the first thing. And the other thing is its empirical performance is also very good. And there was no theoretical uh, analysis of uh, RBMLE. But now uh, we have addressed that issue. And you're extending it to different directions. For example, continuous state space, or diffusions, and uh, uh, many times you don't, you don't want So if your system is sort of uh, just a model is not correct. We don't want your algorithm to perform very bad. So that is called robustness. And we're also analyzing the robustness of this algorithm. Here. For this problem, that is also log three and we match that lower bound. Did that answer your question? Yes. 